I'm Marty Stauffer. The goshawk is the largest of America's occipiters, a group of three long-tailed, short-winged hawks. Its main prey is the equally short-winged and thus equally fast ruffed grouse, sometimes called pheasant or partridge, although it actually is neither. The goshawk was originally named goosehawk by the European falconers who used it to hunt geese. It could be more appropriately called grousehawk because no other predator pursues the hard-to-catch rough grouse with such supreme skill. But catching a grouse is not easy. They stay constantly alert. With formidable beak and talons, the goshawk is the essence of capture. While the grouse has perfected escape, Over the years, a precise balance has developed between these two birds. They are intimately linked in an age-old relationship, and this is their story, a scene in this aspen forest of the Pacific Northwest. Let's look at the hunted and its hunter, the grouse and the goshawk. This is Crater Lake in Oregon. It's the deepest, clearest, bluest body of water in North America. The core of an ancient volcano, it's located at the southern end of the Cascade Mountain Range. Traveling north into Washington State and past Mount Rainier, another dormant volcano, we reach the remote glacier-covered peaks of the northern Cascades. We followed the Great Cascade Mountain Range from south to north, as it parallels the Pacific coast and rises up through three national parks. In Oregon, there's Crater Lake, in Washington State, Mount Rainier, and North Cascades National Park. In the shadow of the Cascades, there live two birds, each a master of its own realm. The powerful goshawk rules the air. The camouflaged ruffed grouse demands the forest floor. Surprise is the goshawk's main hunting technique, but first it must watch, then wait. Its prey waits too, visible through the leafless trees of late winter. Across the North American continent, the slender aspen is the most widespread of all trees. And coinciding almost exactly with the range of aspen trees is that of the ruffed grouse. The range of the goshawk nearly matches both grouse and aspen. The trees are especially important to the ruffed grouse in early spring. That's when the long male flowers, called catkins, are eaten to the exclusion of almost every other plant food. Rich in protein, the flowers help fatten the birds for the demands of the coming mating season. Like many male birds, the grouse cock establishes his territory, but he does not sing. Instead, he drums. The drumming sound carries through the forest and reaches the female, but she's not ready to breed yet. The cock's flapping cupped wings create a series of small vacuums, which then fill with air to produce the drumming sound.
Finally, the female moves closer. Drawn by the glorious display of male, he parades and poses for her, with his head crest erected and tail feathers fanned. Also fully flared is the neck collar, or ruff, for which this species of grouse is named. After a brief mating, the hen will leave, and alone, she will raise her chicks. The promiscuous cock stays behind to mate with other hens. Mixed hardwood and evergreen forest, broken by occasional brushy areas and clearings, with lakes or rivers nearby. Such as traditional grouse and goshawk country. Again, the aspen tree provides a necessity of life. Now in late spring, an aspen is the nesting place for a mated pair of goshawks. The larger female incubates their two eggs. Like the grouse cock that uses his same drumming log for life, so may the goshawk pair return year after year to their high, sturdy nest. Below, on the dark, cool forest floor, hidden among some ferns, is the leafy nest of the rough grouse. The hen is left for one of her brief but frequent foraging trips. As spring blossoms into summer, the adult grouse move from the dense heart of the forest out into the open edges. A wide variety of plant food is now available, but although food is abundant, grouse are not. They are still recovering from a low in their 10-year population cycle. No one knows exactly how or why these lows happen, but it is certain that next year will be better, and the next better yet. When grouse are scarce, so are goshawks. In high years, the female will lay as many as five eggs. This female laid only two, and of her pair, only one hatched. But her maternal instinct is no less intense. From the time of egg laying, until her youngster is nearly ready to feed itself, she lines the nest with evergreen boughs. Perhaps they help to soften and scent the nest, or maybe they're a bit of camouflage. Although it seems very vulnerable on the ground, the grouse nest would be even more exposed to predators if it were in a tree. The mother goes off to feed, leaving her eggs protected by a few ferns. The mother goshawk takes some time off too. Her mate relieves her, bringing in freshly killed prey for their offspring. Always watchful, father and young scan the nearby clearing. Most goshawk nests overlook an open area. Father tears off the meat in strips and feeds it to his ravenous downy. Hunting birds require the care of both parents, and weeks, even months of preparation for their predatory way of life. Weighing little more than a few ounces apiece, four of the young grouse hatchlings find safety in numbers, while the fifth shows its independence. One of the original six eggs never hatched, and by midsummer, another two or three of these chicks will also be gone, taken by predators or, more likely, by rain and cold. Three weeks later, the fledgling goshawk tries out its wings. Most of its soft, fluffy down has fledged into the vertically streaked plumage of a juvenile. 
but it won't leave the nest until it is ready to hunt on its own. Even then, it will not have an easy life, because the hunter has much more to learn than the hunted. Immediately after hatching, the grouse chicks left their nest. Adults eat plants, seeds, and berries. But the rapidly developing chicks feed entirely on insects, important protein for their first month of life. In these northern mountains, the season of plenty is short. Soon, summer's green abundance disappears into the golden days of autumn. One last shimmer of fluttering aspen leaves signals the close of another season. And all the wild creatures ready themselves for the hardships of winter. The mule deer puts on a layer of fat. The badger looks for a spot to dig in and escape the cold. By now, the goshawk is on its own, competing with other hungry predators, like this coyote. Though the goshawk must act like an adult, it still looks like a juvenile, with its brown, vertically striped breast and its yellow eyes. In a year, it will look like this adult, with blue-gray feathers and red eyes. But yellow or red, the goshawk's eyes are among the sharpest in the animal world, and they have a clear eyelid, the nictitating membrane, which allows the bird to see even when close. Well equipped for its hunting life, the goshawk has feet that are literally knee hooks, poor for walking, yet excellent for grasping prey. But equipment is not everything. The grouse has survival tactics of its own. A young, unskilled goshawk will make many attempts before it finally succeeds in catching a grouse. This is the time when many inexperienced goshawks die. With its short, rounded wings, the goshawk can follow the grouse through the trees, but it fails to catch it, and if it fails many more times, it will starve. Icy mist hangs suspended in the frozen air, and the snow deepens as winter arrives, and the grouse move back into the heart of the forest. goshawk waits. Because the ruffed grouse and the goshawk are so evenly matched as predator and prey, and because the young goshawk has not yet perfected its hunting skills, it must wait until it has an advantage. A grouse dives to safety. Its summer camouflage is useless now, so it must hide. But this snow roosting has another purpose, warmth. Grouse burrow into snow roosts to survive the winter nights. The goshawk's eyes are trained to detect movement. Little goes unnoticed, especially when a goshawk is hungry. Although the snow is deep, it may not be deep enough for the grouse to completely hide.
Another predator also tracks the grouse, the red fox, and it has the advantage of a keen sense of smell. In winter, the fox is the major predator of snow roosting grouse. Birds can escape fox and lynx by roosting in trees, but once there, they are open to even more predators. So the snow is still their safest haven. If the snow cover is thin, though, many grouse die when they cannot bury themselves deeply enough for safety and warmth. As one grouse dies, many others live on, some roosting in snow, others roosting on branches, close to pine needles, which are one of their few winter foods. Glowing in the light of a full moon, the starry night sky comes alive in this time lapse. It's a cold and bitter beauty, though, when the temperature drops to 40 below zero. Many grouse do survive the foxes, although this one may be greeting the new day for the last time. But the goshawk cannot abandon its way of life any more than the grouse can. To live means to kill, and the grouse is its companion in this ancient struggle. The goshawk is no more a villain than the grouse is a hero. Some believe that one animal killing another is heartless and cruel. But nature does not judge her creatures by our human emotions. Killing to survive is neither good nor bad. It's simply a way to live. In 
and as much as our sympathy causes us to cheer for the underdog, the grouse, the goshawk is just as vulnerable to nature's laws. Young goshawks have a great deal to learn, and as many as half of them die in their first year. The ones which do survive will take their place as important predators in a balanced natural ecosystem, removing the less fit grouse from the breeding population. When spring comes again, only the best grouse will breed and perpetuate their species. And so, the most important aspect of this relationship is that death is not tragic or final as we might see it, but instead, it's the renewal of life. Ruffed grouse seem destined for extinction about every 10 years, when their populations dramatically peak, then suddenly plummet to near zero. It's not due to goshawk predation, though, but rather is the result of a mysterious natural cycle. The grouse always recover, and overall their future appears bright, partly because they've been restocked into many areas for human hunters who enjoy the challenge they offer. Goshawks, on the other hand, are always rare across their entire range. In the past, they were persecuted by the greatest predator of all, man. Fortunately, today, all birds of prey are protected by state and federal laws. But both the grouse and the goshawk need our further protection. They need a place to live, and only we can provide that through the wise use and management of their ancestral home, the northern forests. It's up to us to determine the ending for the story of the grouse and the goshawk. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. <laughs>